there, I'm Toni Best. I am a basket and gourd artist, and welcome to our first Friday for the Arts Consortium in September. I have been a basket weaver for many years, and I grew up in a family of scientists, so my other sister and I were the family mutants because we both loved weaving. My mother always said to do whatever made you happy, so in eighth grade, our art teacher taught us how to make reed and split baskets, and I was hooked. I gave it to my grandmother when I was 13, and after she died, I got it back. When I got into college, I wanted to be an art major, but my college did not have an applied art major, so I minored in art, and I majored in music. I ended up getting my master's in music from Syracuse University, and I got it in classical organ performance. And I bet you don't know many people that are classical organ performers because I don't know that many either. I have retired from it because there's not that much demand for the organists other than for church music, and my major was different than just church music. So what I have done over the years is I've taken the music that I love so dearly and I apply it to my pine needle coiling and my weaving so that when I'm weaving, I'm making the coils move and undulate and I'm hearing the music, which is why pine needle coiling is listening to the music. Even though I was from a family of scientists, they took us to concerts, to museums, to, to, to galleries, to dance recitals. I started playing the piano just after I was in the third grade. And so I played all through high school and I switched to organ when I was in college. Then after college, I studied with a French organist in Paris for a year. And then from there, I went to Syracuse, where I got my master's. And Virginia was the first time I saw pine needle baskets. And when we were married, we lived in North Carolina, and I belonged to a craft club. And an elderly woman came and taught the, our craft club how to do pine needle baskets. And by George, I was hooked. Because when you're doing it with reed and splits, you've got to have water, it's because they have to be pliable and, and soak, soaking. But with pine needles, I coil with them dry. There are some people that spray them or have them damp, but if you get them too wet and you weave with them, when they dry, the basket shrinks and your stitches and your basket is all wobbly. So I use southern pine, which comes from Florida, they're also called longleaf pine, and they are some of the most pliable pine needles that you can find, and I don't need to have them, them soaked. My sister and her family moved from Maine out to be close to uh, her husband's family that had orange uh, uh, concerns in, in the Exeter Lindsay area. And so when dad died, mom moved out here to be uh, closer to the mountains and to my sister. And so I got to the point that I wanted to be close to them as well. So that's why we moved out here. I have taken from some fine basketry teachers. I've taken from Flo Hoppy that's taught in Japan and all over the world. She taught at our basket conference. I've taken from Eugenia Gwathney and Don Weeke and Jane Stanley and uh, uh, a myriad of other fine basket weavers with different de designs. And then as the years have progressed, I went, in, I started t teaching the pine needles. When I first met with Carol Rookstool up in Three Rivers, there was a friend of hers who was a fine pine needle coiler came up from uh, uh, San Gabriel to teach a class in Three Rivers. And I went up to, to them and, and I signed up for the class and they said, what did you want to learn? Did Have you ever done pine needle weaving before? And I said, yes, I wanted to learn some new stitches and I wanted to learn how to make a handle. 
And so they said, well, do you have any of your pieces with you? And this was pre-gourd, and I said yes. So I, I took them out of my trunk, and I showed them. And they said, well, you know, you, you do good weaving. And, and I said, but I want to learn the stitches and the handles. Mm -hmm. So from then on, Carol had a... Uh, a magazine that was going out, a basketry magazine, but she became the first president of the California Gourd Society. And so she wanted to publicize my classes, but she said until I wove on gourds, she couldn't publicize my classes. So that's why she kept urging me to keep on, uh, to, to try on the gourds. So my first gourd class was at her barn in Three Rivers. She had Eugenia Gwalfney there, and I took a class and once I found that I could really feel comfortable with the saws and everything else, I have found that I could do whatever I wanted on the gourd. And when you make just a pine needle basket in a six hour class, you end up with a three inch by a one inch basket. And you think, ah, oh, gee, isn't this great? Look what I made in six hours. But when you start with a gourd, the gourd is the base on which you're coiling, and in six hours you come away thinking, gee, this is what I created in six hours. So you're coming away with more uh, satisfaction. You can do weaving, pine needle weaving, on or coiling on wood. On uh, There are people that do woodworking that, that do it. On pottery, uh, I do it on uh, agates that have been encased in resin. There, there are endless things that you can do. When I first started the coiling with pine needles, I was more symmetrical. I was captivated by the Native American designs, which I still integrate now and then into my pieces. And I was more symmetrical and more solid. And as I just started to feel the movement and the flow, and I wanted to see that flow and the movement in my pieces. So that's where the, the, the evolution uh, came. There are all different kinds of coils that you can make where one coil does not necessarily attach to the other coil, and that's called a floating coil. And that helps to make the movement. You, with your hands, you're forming your coils like you would if you were a potter. You can make the, the pie needles go out. You can make it, them go in. And you can just do any kind of movement that you desire, or as the Native Americans would say, that the basket tells you. You need to listen to the basket. So frequently I'm setting my pieces across the room and I'm looking at them. And sometimes they talk to me and sometimes they're stubborn and I have a hard time getting them to tell me what they want. So you start with an idea or maybe you see a gourd that's got a special sh a shape and you think, oh, this is just perfect. So you start with something that you're, you're planning on doing and then sometimes the basket says, uh-uh, I don't want to do that. And you think, oh, yes, you do. You really do. And it keeps telling you, no, -uh, I don't want to do that. So you have to re-evaluate and again, listen to the basket and go in the line that they want you to go. When I saw some of the Canary Island pine trees here in Visalia, they were like 12 inches long and yes they were thin but they beat the seven inch uh, pine needles that I was used to in Virginia and so wow it was just I could use pine needles. So my daughter says if she needs uh, therapy it's because I would send her out on her bicycle with a, a, a grocery bag and say there's a tree two blocks over pick me up pine needles so uh, yes yeah, she's she she likes to tell people that she, mom will have to pay for her therapy because of that Native Americans always took time to go with nature and working with a gourd is a very natural material. Gourds you find all over the world. They were indigenous to so many different places. And you, you find them uh, used as 
water bowls, you find them used as storage containers and things like that. And when the Native Americans first started using them, that's what they used them for, utilitarian pieces. But as things evolved, they became more of an art piece. And they then put their art into what had before been a utilitarian basket. So if you look in all the countries, and uh, you'll, you'll find it in, in South America, uh, and, and I've got gourds here that come from South America that you can, can see, and they did uh, the, the dippers and the, 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 the bowls, uh, but they also took gourds and didn't cut into them, and they would do wood burning on them. Sometimes they would take like a nail and put it in the fire and do the wood burning from the 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 hot nail. Um, in in Japan and China, they they mold the gourds as they're growing. Cecile Garrison, who's a local master gardener, she molds gourds uh, now and. So you can get teapots in, in China that are made from molded, molded gourds. Africa, you'll find gourds all over the place. So everywhere you look, there is a history of gourds. And of course, they're the, the wild gourds too, the, like the coyote gourds that a lot of people take and do things with as well. They're too thin to cut into because they would, would crack. So people do light wood burning or they, they paint on them. But those are wild ones that grow, and when you're when you're doing gourds, you you plant them like in April, and the gourds start growing on the plant usually by June and August. You leave the gourds on the vine until the stem has d turned brown and died. If you take it off before then, the gourd can implode and and, and rot. And so coyote gourds, you have to be careful as well not to pick them too green because they can, can rot as well. And the gourds that I use are hard shell. They're called longanaria. And so the hard shell gourds are anywhere from like thin ones that are an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch thick, up to being like three inches thick. And you can't really coil on one that thick. You would have to get your your uh, grinder in and grind it down so that it was thin enough for you to, to coil on. But if you're doing carving, it's, it's uh, fine for things like that. I get them from their, their, I get them from Cecile Garrison, who lives about five minutes from here. Diana Piercy, she's a gourd grower and a wonderful gourd artist in uh, Woodlake. Uh, Sam McKinney, who's a gourd artist in uh, Lindsay, she grows gourds. Um, I'm going to be teaching at, uh, via Zoom at Pocosin, which is a school of fine craft in Columbia, North Carolina. I taught there five years ago, and they asked if I'd do a Zoom class. So I ordered gourds from Wirtz Gourd Farm in uh, Casa Grande because I wanted a, a large amount of a specific uh, small size. So between those, when I was having people work on gourds here, you know, they would throw the gourds seeds out on the ground, and a lot would volunteer. So for two different years, I had gourds, and if you aren't aware of what gourds are like, they're like melons and squash, and they take over, and they take a lot of water. So there was only one time that I put seeds, seeds out deliberately because I had seeds from a really big gourd that I had bought from Russell Bray over in Lindsay, and and. I grew 13 gourds from, from the seeds that I planted there. But the space they take up is just intense. And the leaves are fairly big, and they hide under the leaves, and you can easily step on one and not realize that you're doing it, especially when they're smaller. I love having my backyard, being able to walk there. And then with the water situation, I didn't want to have to spend my, my water allowance on, on the gourds. This is a gourd. It's... <laughs> 
just, uh, it's dried, it's dirty, it's moldy, and so you use a uh, metal scrubber to scrub it, scrub it clean. This is how it should look when it's clean. This is the color. From here to there, it depends on what the outside of the gourd, how bad it is, because sometimes you can't get, there's a sometimes a white film on there and it's very hard to get off. So sometimes you put it in a black plastic bag outside in the sun with a wet cloth in there. Sometimes you use bleach, but it can take, I maybe can get 10 gourds uh, cleaned in in like three hours depending on 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 the gourd and the size and the once the the this is the the part that's the least fun is cleaning the outside and then the insides the same way because sometimes it's really easy to clean like this and then sometimes there's the white film in it and it is horrible and so I, my drill press is what I use uh, to with a flat wheel to get it cleaned on the inside because you want it smooth and nice like this. I use a jigsaw. It's not as big as some jigsaws, but it's it's not a big saw, not a little saw. It's just right. And so after I cut it, then you end up with the inside and the inside sometimes is really easy to clean and sometimes it's not so I use the knife to cut into there so that I can get the blade in and then I have scrapers so then when it's all scraped out on the inside then I clean up clean it so it looks nice and smooth and then I use my Dremel and I put holes all the way across because you have to attach your pine needles to it so this is my HEPA filter mask that I use when I'm doing it. You never want to do it without a mask because between the, the mold spores and the gourd dust, you can really get sick. And then when I'm using my drill press to really clean out the inside, I have my mask that goes in front of everything else. So when it's like this then, I will dye the inside first, usually a dark brown, and then I'll paint a lighter color on the outside and do some drips down. I like to do drips because it makes it more movement. Then once it's dry, then, and I've got it the way I want it, then I'll spray it with a clear acrylic spray. And then I put a coat of glue on the inside to keep bugs from wanting to get in and also to make the inside look more, more finished, more complete. So, like when I had to prepare, um, I think I prepared 70 gourds that I shipped to Arizona. And we're talking that took me three weeks from cleaning to cutting to, to dyeing and everything else. It's major, major time. In 2010, there had been a um, gourd conference up at Asilomar, and it was every other year. And the, there would be teachers coming up for that gourd conference. And the woman that had been handling it got tired and said, I just can't do it anymore. Well, people were saying, oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. We need another gourd conference. So I approached Carol. And I said, Carol, we can do a conference here in Visalia. And so that's how it started. I worked with COS and through their community arts for two different years, in 97 and in 98, I invited teachers, and they, most of them were from around the state, I think also from Arizona, and they taught classes at COS. And then there was a show of the students' work at the gallery there afterwards. And then um, in the COS decided that it was more work than they wanted to handle at that time. so. I was also finding it was more work for me at that time handling the conference, so we went on a hiatus for a while. And then when the uh, when uh, uh, the Asilomar stopped in 2008, that's when we decided to resuscitate the conference that I had in 97 and 98 at COS, and we did it here in Visalia. And we have teachers now that come from all over the country. We have students that come from all over the country, and it's biennial. And if you're not sure what medium or what kind of art, 
you enjoy, try something. If you find that it's not your thing, then go for something else. You've got so many different outlets now with YouTube and in the internet to see different forms of art. Anything that you do on a flat surface, you can do on a gourd. Uh, I'm not saying that you have to be a gourd artist, but it opens up the possibilities. But go for it, because when you're painting something or, or drilling or whether you're dancing, whether you're writing, whatever, you're putting your soul into it. And it gives you fulfillment, and hopefully you're spreading your love of the art out to others. This is a challenge that my brother has given me, and this is called a Klein model. Now, my brother's a physicist, and he says, can you make, make one? And it's one surface, basically, but it's going in and out of each other. And so this is, this is something that I promised him that I will do with a gourd and with weaving. So I've got gourds already picked out and some half cut to, to get this going. So that's, that's my biggest challenge. Whereas sometimes like the two, my, I've got three baskets on the wall that I had as challenges for weaving. Um, that's going to be a, a challenge for me. I have a website, TonyBest.online. I am also on uh, Facebook, Tony Best Art. I have an Etsy shop called Tony Best Baskets. Um, and people have been known to call me and ask if they can come to my house and see if there's something that they want to buy. I usually have something in the gift shop at Arts Visalia. I try to do things with the Arts Consortium, and so there are frequently, or have been in the past, shows there that I have been in. There's a show at COS Library. Uh, it's going to be, um, Amy Rangel has worked that out, and there are, there's, I'm the only Gord artist, there are two other artists. There's different, different media, and so it should be, should be an interesting show. And then the Arts Visalia gift shop has is juried this year for the holiday show. Uh, so I sent in some pictures for that as well. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. First Fridays are a lot of fun, and Ampelli always makes sure that we have a great first Friday to look forward to the next month. So thank you for coming, and join us next month.